Today we're going to do something a little different. The Intellectual Challenge of the Gospel by Cornelius Van Til, THM, PhD, uh, published in London, the Tyndall Press, 1950. This lecture was delivered at the Tyndall House, Cambridge, on July 10th, 1950, at the meeting convened by the Tyndall Fellowship for Biblical Research. The Intellectual Challenge of the Gospel. Introduction. <clears throat> While the Apostle Paul was at Corinth, the Lord spoke to him in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, he was told, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Had Paul been afraid to bring the simple gospel of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to the city of Corinth, with its Jews and with its Greek? Had Paul been afraid to bring the simple gospel of the death and resurrection to the city of Corinth with its Jews and its Greeks? If so, he was afraid no longer, after the vision he had been given. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? <clears throat> Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. If the Corinthians would but look at the facts as they are, and particularly as they have been shown themselves to be in the course of history, they would be compelled to acknowledge the bankruptcy of the wisdom of man. What answer had Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle been able to give to the deepest problems of life? Shall we say that they gave no answer? No, indeed, for they could not escape giving an answer, but the answers they had given were wrong. Their wisdom had been made foolishness with God. In the light of the narrative which Paul brought, the wisdom of the Greeks was not merely inadequate, it was sinful. <clears throat> Man had originally been made perfect. He had then in Adam broken the covenant that God had made with him. He was now a covenant breaker and, as such, subject to the wrath of God. Having such a view of the nature of man, Paul did not merely plead for a complete system, for the recognition of the spiritual dimension as well as the material. He did not want merely to add the idea of the personal confrontation with Jesus Christ to that of the impersonal study of the laws of nature. In short, he did not ask for the privilege of erecting an altar to the living God, creator of heaven and earth, next to the altar to gods that have been born of human minds. He pleaded for, and in the name of his Lord, required of men a complete reversal of their point of view in every dimension of life. The entire house of their interpretation of life had to be broken down. Many of the building blocks that they had gathered could no doubt be used, but only if the totality of a of the totally new architectural plan that Paul proposed were followed. <clears throat> but how could Paul expect that covenant breakers should become covenant keepers? How could those who had worshipped and served the creature more than the creator be expected to turn from their evil way? Would they turn as soon as it was shown to them, intellectually, that the wisdom of this world has been made foolishness with God? Indeed not. Their minds had been darkened. They would appear to others to see while they did not see. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Or could they be expected to desire and will to believe that which might seem intellectually paradoxical to them? No, St. Paul did not expect that. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8, 7. Yet the apostle did not despair. He did not lower the requirements of the gospel in order to get men to accept it. Being truly all things to all men, sacrificing himself without limit for the sake of the Jew and Gentile alike, he yet continued to insist always on the complete rejection of the wisdom of man and on the substitution of it for the foolishness of God. For this, he had good reason. Let me just pause for a moment. Um, what has modern evangelicalism and even a lot of what, what, what is called the Reformed faith today have done uh, but lower the requirements on biblical worship and the requirements of ethics to cater to the modern world? 
where uh, if you watch advertisements on TV or YouTube for the local churches, these big mega churches, what are they advertising? Come and, inter and look at our entertainment, made for man, designed by man, for man. And what is that but a watering down of the requirements of the gospel in the area of uh, worship? And that's what the church has done, to cater to sinful man. And Paul would have nothing of that. Continuing. He knew all the evidence was for the truth of his message. Can anyone really doubt that God, the God whom Paul preached, does exist? The eternal power and God have got, of Paul's gospel are clearly visible to all men everywhere. See Romans 1.19. Paul speaks of his requirements through all the facts with which man deals. He speaks to men in the works of creation and, provide, and providence. He speaks also to men through their conscience. Romans 2.14 and 15. He spoke at the beginning of history in direct supernatural fashion to Adam. All men are therefore without excuse. There is no fault in the, in the objective revelation of God to men. It is perspicuous. No one can escape being confronted with it. There is no area of impersonal relationships where the face of God, the creator, and judge does not confront man. It is not as though the evidence shows that a God exists, that a God exists, or that God probably exists. If such were the case, then there would be some excuse for man if he did not bow before his maker. But Paul makes the bold claim, makes bold to claim that all men know deep down in their hearts that they are creatures of God and have sinned against God, their creator, and their judge. Nor is it as though the evidence for theism were clear, but the evidence for Christianity were obscure. Paul boldly asserts that men are bound to believe the facts of Christianity to be true as soon as they hear them. When he declares the fact of the resurrection of Christ, he asserts that through it, all men have been given assurance of the day of final judgment by the Son of Man. Through Paul's gospel, then, objective truth stands before men as a challenge. Men cannot react neutrally towards it. They must accept it or suppress it because they do not want to believe it. <clears throat> Paul knows that those who cling to the wisdom of the world do so against their better not judgment and with an evil conscience. Every fact of theism and every fact of Christianity points with an accusing finger at the sinner saying, You are a covenant breaker. Repent and be saved. The truth Paul brings requires response, the response of repentance. And repentance is the work of the whole man. Paul's truth is existential. He who rejects it virtually commits suicide both intellectually and morally. Yet Paul also knows that sin is of such a character as to make men prefer intellectual and moral suicide to the truth of God and Christ. Repentance means the recognition of bankruptcy. It involves the supplicant's attitude begging for mercy, for pardon, for life. It means fleeing from the city of destruction and pressing on to the celestial city, even when Mr. Worldly Wiseman and all his friends are going in the other direction. It means bearing the offense of the cross. Will any of the wise of the world accept his gospel and repent? Yes, they will. Paul is quite sure of that. He knows that God has much people in, in the city. He knows that he himself has been, a persecute, has been a persecutor. He remembers vividly how the Lord appeared to him. Am I not an apostle? Am I not <coughs> my work in the Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Now that Jesus has come into the world to save his people, his spirit will set them free. The spirit will take the things of Christ and give them to his people. God's work is one. God the Father so loved the world that he gave his Son, that they who believe might be saved. God the Son came into the world to do the will of his Father. God the Spirit will give men hearts of flesh instead of hearts of stone. The believers in Corinth were the work of the apostle. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tablets of stone but in fleshly tables of the heart. And that's 1 Corinthians 9.1. The natural man, who, has, who of himself cannot discern the things of the Spirit, is by that Spirit renewed in knowledge, after the image of him who created him. Colossians 3.10 This renovation is said to be eis epinosis, not in knowledge, much less by knowledge, but unto knowledge. 
so that he knows. Knowledge is the effect of the renovation spoken of. Moreover, the knowledge here intended is not mere cognition. It is full, accurate, living, or practical knowledge. Such knowledge is as eternal life. So that this word here includes what in Ephesians 4.24 is expressed by righteousness and holiness. With this assurance that the Spirit of God who had enveloped him in heavenly light and turned him from being a persecutor to being an apostle, can and will enable men to turn from the wisdom of the world in order to accept his gospel. Paul goes forth boldly among men, everywhere, speaking for him who spoke to Lazarus in his tomb. Paul does not hesitate to speak to those who are dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2.1 He expects that the Spirit will in sovereign mercy enable men to repent. It is God, the Spirit, who makes men do that, which in their folly they would otherwise not have done. Are not ye my work in the Lord? If you, who were enamored of the wisdom of the world, have now turned to be, turned it, owned it to be foolishness, you must go forth with the same challenge I presented unto you. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Shall we as Christians facing the wisdom of the world in modern times dare to do what Paul tells those who are his work in the Lord to do? Shall we desire to be steadfast and unmovable, never doubting the objective truth of the message that we bring, never doubting that the wisdom of this world has again been made foolishness with God? Shall we have full confidence <coughs> that our labor will not be in vain in the Lord? Let me just pause for a second. Van Til lived in an era. His career started in the 19, late 20s. And he, uh, I think he retired around 1970, probably, maybe a little later. Uh, he lived in an era when uh, mod mod modernity and modernism or Christian liberalism was spreading like wildfire and raging through all the mainline Protestant denominations. When the solution was said to be, let's let's compromise with the world, let's let's integrate modern secular science into our theology so we can doubt the early chapters of Genesis or reinterpret them to include theistic evolution or whatever. And these things were constantly going on. And Valentil saying, no, 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 no. Reject all that nonsense. Don't compromise with the world. Stick to the word of God. Stick to the word of God. Don't compromise. Now, evangelicalism, modern evangelicalism, says they follow the inerrancy and infallibility uh, of Scripture, that it's inspired by God breathed out by God. But what they've done is simply compromised in all those practical areas of worship and all those things that offend the world to get bigger churches. <laughs> Let's have entertainment-centered worship made up by man, entertaining to man, so that we can have a big church. So what the liberals did with theology, evangelicals have done with worship. And they've also done it to theology as well, de-emphasizing theology as unimportant and in its place putting... Uh, psychological therapy and, and, and all kinds of stuff about uh, prosperity. But continuing. Romanism. <clears throat> the Roman Catholic answer cannot answer these questions in the affirmative. He refuses to challenge the wisdom of the world in the order of nature. Did not God, he says, create man in his own image? And is not man he had surrounded with the revelation of God? Why should he not then be able to interpret natural nature aright? Was not Aristotle right when he concluded that, that from the fact of motion in the world that there must be an unmoved mover back of the world? The Protestant replies pointedly that the God of Aristotle is not the God of Christianity. The God of Aristotle did not create the world, knows nothing of the world, knows nothing of himself. He is not a person, let alone the triune God of Christianity. Aristotle's God is an it. Yet, all, yet Aristotle was not inconsistent with, in his reasoning. On his premises, his highest principle of knowledge and of being could be nothing else than an it. But man cannot worship an it. He must always come back to a person. He must begin and end his system of thought either with himself or with God. And since Aristotle does not begin with God but with man, that is with himself, he ends his system with man, that is with himself. And what Aristotle did has been done over and over and over again. In modern times, it has been done by such men as Descartes, 
Spinoza, Leibniz, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, Kant, Hegel, and many others following them. Okay, we could include Marx, Feuerbach, many others. To be sure the Protestant continues. The non-Christian thinker has said many things that in themselves and formally are true. When Aristotle said that God is a pure act, he said verbally the same thing that the soundness of Christian theologians also says. Yet the Christian theologian would be referring to the internally self-complete triune God, and Aristotle would be referring to an abstract principle of logic or being. No greater difference in content could be imagined. So also when the Stoics asserted that man is the offspring of God, the Apostle Paul does not hesitate to accept such a statement as formally true. But for the Stoics, man was a piece of God, a piece with God, while for Paul, man was created by God. In content, there was a difference of truth and falsity between them. Again, when the pantheist says that he believes in the immanence of God, and when the deist says that he believes in the transcendence of God, shall the theist say that he is richer than both because he believes in both the transcendence and the immanence of God? If he did, he would be building the house of his theology as children build their houses of blocks. The immanence of the pantheist spells identity between man and God, and the transcendence of the deist spells separation of man from God. How then can these two concepts of identity and separation be added together and produce the theistic conception of the relation of God to man? The meaning of words derives from the total system from which they form their part. And this is one of the grand essences of Van Til. <clears throat> we don't discuss uh, facts or statements of philosophy or theology uh, atomistically apart from a system. Everything relates to the system as a whole. Therefore, when the Jehovah's Witness speaks of God, or the Jew, the modern unbelieving Jew speaks of God, uh, on the surface, formally, you may say, well, yeah, he's talking about God, but no. The God that is defined by the whole system of Christianity is totally different than what the modern Jew and what the uh, cultist and what the Mohammedan teaches. So this is actually very brilliant. And then uh, the fo uh, he has a footnote down here. Wilhelm Pock also still follows the blockhouse method of comparing systems when he speaks of Schleiermacher as having, as a hardcore German liberal, as having stressed the imminence of God and of Bart as having stressed the transcendence of God. The Heritage of the Reformation, Boston, 1950. And uh, Van Til was a great critic of Bart. He wrote a big, thick, fat book against Karl Bart. Total, total heretic. Still further, the Protestant adds, non-Christian thinkers in general and non-Christian scientists in particular may discover much that is true about the universe that is made by God. Perhaps most of the great discoveries of science have been made by those who are not Christians, but such discoveries could not have been made unless the universe is what the Christian says it is, namely, created and controlled by God. There would be no order in nature and no rationality of relationships to be found anywhere in the universe had not God made them. Therefore, the possibility of science itself presupposes the truth of the Christian concept of God. When then the non-Christian scientist discovers truth, this is not because of, but in spite of, his own theory of being and of knowledge. In other words, <coughs> the statement, uh, they may state a fact about the moon. They may state a fact about geology or this or that. But their fact within their own system is not really true, unless you call it, refer to it as purely a surface isolated fact. But in the Christian system, that explains the fact, and it explains why the fact is true. Okay, knowledge, uh, one's epistemology or knowledge, uh, makes full sense. It's logical and rational in the Christian system, but not in the unbelieving system. It is not difficult to see what happens if the Christian fails to challenge the wisdom of the world in order in the order of nature. If he remains, if he keeps quiet, the providential elephant is given permission to push his trunk through the window. Soon the order of the supernatural is adjusted to the order of nature as interpreted by the natural man. The Roman Catholic starts this philosophy with the idea of being in general. Aristotle says that being is analogical, applied to the relation between God and man, that this idea of the analogy of being uh, implies that man takes its beginning from a pure potentiality but ends up with becoming pure actuality. If the idea of the analogy of being in general could allow for the meaning of history, which it cannot, then it would involve man's total separation from God in the past and his total identification with God in the future. Thus, the entire pylon gospel of man's creation by God, his breaking of the covenant at the beginning of history, 
the work of <coughs> at the beginning of history, the work of Christ in history and the work of the Holy Spirit in the application to sinners of the work done for them by Christ would be denied. No sound Christian theology can be attached to the Arist uh, Aristotelian notion of the analogy of being. And by the way, this is proof that the false accusations that, that Van Til follows Karl Barth and is an analogical thinking, and that his, his system of analogical thinking is totally unscriptural. Uh, this, this, what I've just quoted, proves that that's false, and that's a, that's a very unfair reading of Van Til. Is this, sometimes his statements on analogical uh, being and thinking, are, sometimes they're difficult. But I think if you interpret within the full work of Van Til, it makes sense. The moral of all this for Protestants should be, uh, should surely be to challenge the wisdom of the world in every dimension. If it is not challenged in every dimension, it cannot be effectively challenged in any one dimension. If a tunnel is to be built under a river, it may be wise to start from both sides of the river at the same time, but it cannot be wise to have two engineers working each from one side without agreeing agreement on the general plan of construction. And once again, this comes from Van Til's brilliant pointing out. <coughs> every discussion of a fact, every discussion of logic, every discussion of philosophy occurs within one's whole system, world and life system. And that is why uh, whatever the secular humanist or atheist says about nature is irrational and cannot be justified by their own system. Here, here it's called the heritage of the Reformation. It, it is therefore the Protestant rather than the Romanist who may be expected to challenge the wisdom of the world. It is a genius of Protestantism to make the God of the Scriptures the final reference point of all predication. In Protestantism, man is really taken to be a creature of God. Man is not thought of as a participant with God in some uh, principle of being that is above and, ex and exemplified in both. Protestantism does, in contrast with Romanism, make the creator-creature distinction basic in its thought. The true Protestant refuses to say as, such, as much as one word, being in general. To speak about being in general is, in effect, to deny the sufficiency of God. It is to subject God to a standard that is above him. It is to shift man's final allegiance away from God to an abstract principle of being and logic. And this, in turn, amounts to shifting man's allegiance away from God to man himself. Okay, let me just stop for a moment to help you understand this. <clears throat> the Greeks spoke of, uh, the ancient Greeks, at least some of them, spoke of ethics as existing out there in a realm of ideals to which their concept of God and man could look to the special independent realm of ideals. And what does that do? It makes ethics above God. No, true ethics, true morality comes solely from God. He's the foundation of all predication. He's the foundation and source of all knowledge and discussion of knowledge. Okay, uh, So in the realm of being and in the realm of ethics, uh, God has to be the source. And what, what men want to do is take, take that away from God and have God subject, like saying the, the principles of logic are above God. No, the principles of logic come from God. Do you see what I'm saying? And, and, and if you say the principles of logic exist outside of God, then you have something above God, and that can't be true. The principles of logic come from God. This is precisely what the philosophers, as Calvin speaks of them, have done. They, with, with all men, are sinners and therefore have an axe to grind. They do not want to find God their creator. Though they cannot help being confronted with him all the time and everywhere, they seek assiduously to suppress this revelation. They seek for an exclusively immanistic, immanentistic principle of explanation of all the phenomena with which they deal. They say that all is water, and that all is infinite, and that all is air. Excuse me. And that all that air, and that all is number, and that all is change, and nothing is change. Or when driven to the recognition of mystery and transcendence, they say that nothing intelligible can be said about the really transcendent one. Whatever the differences between them, they are all agreed in assuming that the creator-creature distinction is not to be taken as basic for all possible predication. If they introduce the creator-creature distinction at all, they introduce it after they have said or assumed at least some basic things about being in general. 
the wisdom of the world is always monistic in the sense that it does not make the creator-creature distinction basic in its thought. Monism just means one, everything is oneism. It's, it's the basis of ancient Greek philosophy. It's the basic of Hinduism and Eastern philosophy. You know, we're all God. The rock is God. The dog is God. And everything is just an evolu uh, an epiphenomenon. It's, everything is just an evolution of, of, all, of material plus chance, etc. <clears throat> A true Protestantism, therefore, will differentiate in its thought from that of the wise men of this world. The Romanist seeks for an alliance between a system of thought which affirms and a system of thought which denies the basic character of the creator-creature distinction. And you have to understand, the reason he's talking about Aristotle so much, Roman Catholicism, primarily through Thomas Aquinas and even earlier, uh, really adopted a, a whole bunch of Aristotelian philosophy into their system of theology. And, and that's how Thomas Aquinas believes you can reason your way to God through logic apart from divine revelation. The Protestant builds a system squarely upon the creator-creature distinction and opposes those who build on the idea of being in general, or thought in general. In consequence, there is also a fundamental difference between Romanism and Protestantism on the concept of revelation. Romanism is willing to make the common cause with those for whom the very idea of revelation is absurd. Those who deal with being in general, or thought in general, cannot entertain the ideal of revelation. The idea of revelation is based on the creator-creature distinction. Those of themselves claim to participate in some measure in being in general and thought in general have no need of revelation. They already assume the presence within them of a principle of con continuity that is beyond God and man. For them, God can, at best, be a bigger brother or a greater scientist. Okay, just stop for a moment. This is the basis of why modernists and liberals say that miracles in the Bible can't be true. They assume this continuity. They assume the secular humanistic principle, and then they use it to overturn revelation instead of accepting revelation and using it to overturn the philosophy of the secular humanist. <clears throat> Nor could the fall of man change all this. He who in any way seeks a being in general cannot think of sin as a willful transgression of the revealed will of God on the part of the creature. Sin will be thought of as basically a failure to live up to the part that he feels he ought to play in reality as a whole. Thus, his own experience rather than the revelation of God to sinful men in scripture will be the final test for him what is right and what is wrong. Let that sink in for a minute, how brilliant this is. Men rejected God. We re they rejected Christianity primarily in the 1800s and then really strongly in the 20th century. And then man becomes the lawmaker. Man makes autonomous law. Man makes a law apart from divine revelation. Then what has man been doing since the 1960s? They de not only declare their own law apart from God, they declare their own reality. Well, I believe I'm a woman. Therefore, I am a woman. And for you to doubt that, we have to suppress you and coerce you and mistreat you. I believe that uh, my desires... My homosexual desires are good because that, those are my desires. See where autonomy takes you? It takes you to man completely acting as God, acting totally absurd. And where do you draw the line? What if a man believes he's a horse? What if a man believes he's a porpoise? They don't base anything on science as far as experimental science or, or uh, science proved by repeated observation, repeated uh, experiments. It's basically simply an affirmation that we have to accept based on the fact that they said it, which is pure subjectivism, purely arbitrary. And this is the basis for persecuting the church in America, Canada, Europe, New Zealand, Australia, over sodomite rights and over the transgendered perversion, which is a gross perversion. You see where this takes you. For the Protestant, however, it is the Bible that is the supreme rule of faith and life. For the Romanist, it is the Bible as infallibly interpreted through the church. And in this case, the church itself is molded, not according to the principles of the Bible, but at least in part, according to the wisdom of the experience of man. Okay, we're going to stop there. I'm going to continue this. I got at least a couple more. Um... I really like this because this Van Til's taking his philosophy and he's making it quite simple.
for people to understand. Very easy to understand. Van Til's the most important Christian philosopher of the 20th century. There's no question. He's the most important philosopher. He said some things that could be taken the wrong way, and not everything he said was correct. I agree. But you take the good things that he said, and the majority of his philosophy, it's absolutely critical to getting rid of this idea that we have common ground with the unbeliever and that we should, this, he calls it building block methodology, where you take the principles of the world to form a philosophy, and then you simply add Christianity on top of that. No, he says you have to completely get rid of all the pagan stuff, all the autonomous human thought, and the whole structure from foundation up has to be Christian, has to be biblical, has to be based on the scriptures. It's brilliant, and it's what the scriptures teach. But we'll stop there. Father, we thank you for our beloved brother Van Til, who's up in heaven with you. We thank you so much for his ministry. Help us to understand uh, his teachings and apply them. For we live in a time when secular humanism is becoming epistemologically self-consistent with itself and becoming more and more and more absurd, more and more hostile to your son and in the faith. So help us, Lord, to fight it with your word your inspired, infallible word. In Jesus' name, amen.